and we're both part of the VMS team. Uh, we want to thank you for coming out and joining us today for DevOps. Um, you're a welcome guest. If there's anything we can do to make your stay and visit better, just let us know. And we turn the floor back over. Well, uh, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself again, Julie, for the broadcast, okay. and then uh, you can begin your presentation. All right, great. Um, once again, my name is Julie Norris, and I was the product line director at Stone Branch. And Stone Branch is a small, privately held company outside of Atlanta, Georgia. Um, we're a worldwide company. We've got a lot of customers over in Europe and different parts of the world. And it, three years ago, we merged with a company called OpsWise, and that's what brought me to Stone Branch because I'd worked with the founders and developers of this next generation automation tool. So I've been there for three years now, helping do product line direct, you know, direction and different things like that, and moved over into an account management role. But I still do the live in 45. Pretty much we do a webinar every month. Um, all of our documentation is online. We have demos online, a video classroom, all kinds of stuff. So if you like what you hear, see here today, you can get more from our website. But I've been in this business. I'll go to the next slide. It kind of tells you a little bit more about my background. I actually started in the data center in IT operations a long time ago <laughs> and spent the first 20 years in my first career, I say, in my first 20 years I spent doing that in different roles of scheduling and operations and, and you know, throughout the data center and watched the growth from the mainframe to the distributed and, and you know, on to other platforms now. And I kind of moved from that, uh, we went through a couple of different job scheduling products, if you remember that, that terminology, and moved into more of a general purpose automation. And that got me to this process analysis and improvement team. And that's where I really kind of saw the beginnings of what DevOps has become. Because we were analyzing recurring problems and repeated failures and said, there's got to be a reason for this. Well, operations would just fix the failure every night and not tell the development team that there was a problem that they could fix once and for all. So there was not that communication going back and forth. And as soon as we established some of that communication, I actually brought one of the developers over and showed him the, the next generation automation tool that we had brought in at the time. And he says, God, if I had had my hands on this when I was developing, I would have developed it a lot differently to take advantage of some of those capabilities. So that always stuck in my mind. And I've kind of stayed in the automation space. And like I said, I came to Stone Branch three years ago because they built a next generation automation tool. Job scheduling has been around for over 30, 35 years. Um, CA7, if some of you guys remember, that's over 35 years old. So the next generation has got to be completely web-based. It's got to be cloud-enabled. It's got to be dynamic. We've got to be developing enhancements for it in a matter of weeks and months, not years, uh, because that's just how fast technology is moving. So I kind of work with customers that, to talk about the business value and the focus on automation. So I'm going to share some customer stories with you today as I go through this. Um, some that I've worked with with different products, but the, the concepts are the same. Um, it's, it's achieved with automation. So that's kind of my background and, and where we'll be going. So, you know, from design and development to operations, when I was in the operations world, I had a manager that always told me, I don't build the plane, I fly the plane. I let the designers and the developers build it, and then my job is to fly it. So they gather the business specs, the initial design, and do all the simulation and testing. And then hopefully it comes over to me and we can fly it fine. There's no issues, no problems. I get the tested product, I implement it into production, and we have our ongoing operation. But there were numerous times where what was built and tested, once it got to production, did not work the way we wanted it to. So there were times where that communication didn't exist and we got it to production and it was kind of crash and burn. So I really was kind of um, a champion for getting development and operations to talk early and often. And when we brought some of these automation tools in with the capabilities that they had, a lot of our customers kept seeing that too. So they were bringing you know, the, the developers in and they were giving them access to an automation tool. So you know, we had a presentation a few years ago, or actually a few months ago, I'm sorry, for some of our customers over in Europe. And we talked about the DevOps philosophy, and we had one of our customers uh, who is Orbitz up in Chicago, and they presented, and they were talking about this collaborative development. And he actually had videos in his presentation of his development staff 
using our solution to build and design the product to do the processing for them from the get-go. So the first thing they went to was OpsWise to see how they could automate this and do the SQL queries or the stored procedures or, or the Java stuff or whatever it happened to be to process the data they wanted to process. And the whole flow of DevOps with the collaborative development, the continuous monitoring and feedback is kind of the model for how StoneBranch develops OpsWise and our software solutions. We want constant feedback from our customers. We do small releases. We do a major release a year, but there's lots of little small releases. And in those small releases, you not only see bug fixes, but you see a lot of enhancements. And those are coming from our customers directly. So we get them into the product as fast as we can so that we can deliver the products that our customers need and the automation that re they require. So this is really kind of the model behavior behind Stone Branch and our development philosophy for automation. So what we want to avoid is this blame game, and I'm sure you guys have all been there where it ran fine in tests. I don't know why you can't run it in production, you know, and everybody's pointing fingers at each other, and operations is incompetent. Why didn't they use other technology? And it's like if you can bring everybody that's to the table together, and what's even better, the utopia, is if you can let them use the same tools and develop it and automate it from the get-go and then go through a, a process with the life cycle stages and get it over into production with as little change as possible between environments. And that's what the automation is enabling customers to do. So we want to avoid that blame game. And really, if you, you look at some of the philosophies of the different areas, you know, development is about creating change, managing to the business requirements, you know, adding new processes, modifying processes, you know, simulating as much as they can in test, but in a lot of cases the test environment is completely different from the production environment. There's all different kinds of nuances in production, so operations is trying to control the change and facilitate the change, but they've, they're looking at the bigger picture. Um, I know when I converted scheduling products a couple of times, we actually had to separate some data centers and move workload around to different data centers. And the only place we could find that knew how everything hung together in the bigger picture was in the scheduling department because they knew how all of the jobs ran and how it all coordinated with one another. So even development, when we were creating disaster recovery scenarios, are like, I didn't know it ran like this. And we got graphical flow charts and pretty pictures out of the applications and showed them. We're like, okay, how do I do a DR test on that? We're like, I don't know how you even run it every week because I had no idea it was that involved in all of the pieces and the parts of it. So having that visualization that the automation provides is a, is a key picture here too. So we want to bridge that gap. So with automation, uh, one of the things that we do at, at Stone Branch is we want a common intuitive automation tool. We, want, we don't want to have a tool out there that you're going to have to go through three days of training to even be able to use the tool. We want to be able to install it in a matter of hours get you using it in another few hours, and then get you more and more competent as you use different parts of it. So we want it to be a very intuitive tool. You shouldn't have to go through a lot of training to learn an automation tool. And we want to utilize modern technology, so completely web-based. Uh, we want it to be able to run in the cloud. And, and some of the things that they did with this, too, was they made the agents um, that the automation talks to self-registering. So there's no configuration issues. One of the biggest challenges with some of the products out there on the market today are, are the configuration issues. Yeah, I can roll out new agents, but configuring them to the controlling engine takes me another you know, act to do, and it takes some configuration tools to do, and you shouldn't have to have a whole suite of tools to do the automation that you're required. So we wanted to use modern technology, and we wanted to balance security with accessibility. Because as you're rolling out automation um, beyond DevOps, and we've even got customers like Orbis as one that's rolling it out even to the business areas. So the business users even have access to some of the dashboard reporting tools and some of the things so they don't have to pick up the phone and call somebody and say, what's going on with my processing? They can just go right to their dashboard and see it. But we want to be able to give that, that visibility and that accessibility in a secure way so they can't do any damage, do no harm. Um, so that's how automation is, is bridging the gap between these. So we want to have widespread access, accessibility even for mobile devices. So one of the first things I did three years ago when I interviewed was I wanted to see it run from my, from my iPad. 
I wanted to see it run from the touch screens and be able to see all of that visual stuff. And you can do that. The only thing, the touch screen still hijacks some of the drag and drop capabilities, but they're getting better at that. I want it to have incredible ease of use and advanced built-in capabilities. I was around job scheduling for over 30 years, and it was, yeah, you can have this capability, but you got to pay me this for it and, and license this additional component. We wanted to build in as much as we could into the base product and not nickel and dime customers you know, to, to use more and more advanced automation. So we enabled it for the cloud. It was the first cloud-enabled solution. We've got graphical visualization. I'm a, I'm a very visual person, so I like to see the pretty pictures, but I like to drill in and get to the detail as well, and I'll show you that when we do the demo. Um, we've built in a reporting database within this tool, and there's hundreds of tables that you can report on, but I'll show you there's three that most customers use, the activity, the audit, and the history. It's really the basic. There's some other tables that you can use to give you some more information. And then the big part was the life cycle management. And, you know, when I when I saw the job evo or the evolution of job scheduling to workload automation, what was missing was the the structure of moving it from a development environment to a QA environment to a test to a production. We built that in to our automation solution so that you can even bundle different components together and move them all in one fell swoop and even back them out if you need to if something has gone wrong once you get it over there. So I'll show you some of those, how we fulfilled some of these automation requirements today. So, you know, like I said, Opswise, Opswise and Stone Branch merged three years ago, but Opswise has been around for over five years now. It was the first cloud deployable automation solution and this is one of the the first workflows they built, but I think somebody in the introductions was talking about workflows, and, and to me the workflows is just the logical order of how these things need to run, and even if there's conditional dependencies and things between them, but I wanted to be able to see it from a, a web-based interface. I didn't want to have to install desktop software and have that kind of headache to deal with, and if you have to update everybody's version of the software, you have to go to everybody's desktop. It's a completely web-based solution. And you'll see more of that. The components to it, um, there's an Opswise controller component, and that's kind of the main engine. And like I said, it's got auto registering agents out there. You can put firewall rules in there so you can control what it has access to. And there's no client install. It sits in an Apache Tomcat container. And you can run it on Windows, Unix, Linux, Z Linux, uh, lots of different environments that we support. But it's got the ease of deployment and ease of upgrading. So that's kind of the main component with it. But it does allow you to do lots of different types of workload. And legacy used to just refer to the mainframe. Legacy now is even some of the Unix platforms and, and Linux and Windows. Um, so I from. <laughs> So, you know, some of the things that coming from the job scheduling world, you know, when we got into things like SQL queries and, and database procedures and web services, and I would do presentations. I was in an SE back in those days and do presentations, and, and those people would kind of look at you like deer in the headlights. They had no idea what you were talking about. But if we had the development team in the room, they would sit up and take notice and say, hey, I can do that SQL query or that store procedure and, and connect it to a script that I'm running over here and something else that I'm doing over here. We, we kind of outgrew the operations world at that point because we were getting into environments and technologies that they weren't familiar with. So we really had to, do, to, to talk to the whole DevOps team and talk to both operations and the development teams, um, especially so many companies still today, the SAP is controlled by the applications people, or the development people, or the business area, um, things like that. We wanted to bring it all together because SAP has some nice processing capabilities, but if it's got a predecessor or successor outside of its world, it doesn't handle that real well. So we had to bring the entire world together in here. So those are some of the platforms we can manage. The intuitive user interface was something we, we wanted from the get-go. So we wanted to, to be able to drag and drop workflows to have that visualization, the so graphical pie chart reporting and, and bar charts and all different kinds of charts that you'll see here in our reporting in a minute. And we wanted it to be from a web-enabled device. And we're actually doing some more development there to make that even better on some of the handheld devices to make it more user-friendly. So we wanted the visibility for the stakeholders to have 
customizable dashboards and the integrated reporting and distribution. So many co companies we would talk to, they're like, yeah, I would really like to do reporting, but I don't want to buy that component from our current vendor because of X, Y, or Z. So we wanted to integrate the reporting within the product. And then we also wanted to make it modern to have the modern scheduling technology. So you know, we had to have all of the old date and time triggers because we do some conversions from customers who are using some of the older technology out there and just really are trying to either modernize their infrastructure or we'll hear about mainframe modernization where the mainframe's not going away, but they need to move some of that software that's currently running on the mainframe to another platform. So they don't want that dependency on it. So being able to do variables and doing dynamic job selection and making decision points during a workflow was something that we wanted to build into the product. So there's actually, we call it OpsWise Op Automation Center, and there's three components to it. There's an additional OpsWise MFT, and this was part of the legacy stone branch. So co companies that were doing FTP or SFTP and we're finding, you know, there were there's compliance issues with that and really needed to get to something more modern or something that would handle a lot of different protocols. We had an MFT solution. And then we have a common Opswise Universal Agent here, and we have customers that run anywhere from five agents to twenty thousand agents because they're using our universal agent that can run off of some of the old legacy job scheduling products and they've got it deployed on every server that they have out there. Um, so they're using it as a common agent, and it also integrates with the OpsWise controller. The controller really is the engine or the quarterback of the whole thing, and he's going to determine where jobs run and where to send them to and get statuses back and anything from the Amazon cloud. We have a customer up in Seattle that's got the entire solution deployed in the cloud. Um, so they're running it from a cloud service and a cloud provider out there. So those are the three components. We're really going to touch on the OpsWise controller and the universal agent mostly today and not really get into too much of the MFT, but I can talk to you about that offline if you want to do that. From an architectural standpoint, um, some of the customers require to have the high availability, so you would have a primary active OpsWise controller, and we use a relational database. It can be Oracle, MS SQL Server, or MySQL. Um, choose whichever type of database you want to use. There's a middle layer that we call the OpsWise Messaging Service, and we've just um, upgraded that, replaced uh, what used to be there. So it's got uh, better portability, better, better scalability, and guaranteed messaging. So we don't lose any kind of traffic messages going back and forth between the controller and the variety of agents that he manages down there. And then we just use LDAP for security, Active Directory, um, and we put the ports on here for our customers that are, are looking at implementing this. I've got two proof of concepts starting this week with different customers. And we also put kind of the sizes down there so you can see that those agents are, are very lightweight footprint that go in there and they track the workload back and forth and communicate back and forth to the uh, controller. And like I said, the agents are all self-registered, so there's no configuration component. You can install those and have them automatically register with the controller and be available for work. So for companies who are looking at cloud to manage um, scalability and things like that, it makes it real simple for them to do that. So visual dashboards, this is kind of the beginning of a lot of PowerPoint slides that I've got in here that have screenshots. So rather than do screenshots, since I do have to do the OpsWise 45 every month <laughs> and have done many of these, we're going to go live. If that's okay with everybody. <clears throat> so I'll get some more screen space on here. I'm going to hide this left-hand side, and we'll get back to that after we do some of the uh, dashboards. So this is kind of the first screen that you see when you come into OpsWise. And I can move these windows around however I, I want to move them and configure these. These are saved to your own personal user logon ID. So you can set this up however you want to and move things around. This is kind of one I built from my operational background to look at things like critical SLAs. I've got some tasks out there that are waiting for resources. Some tasks that have been held out there for whatever reason. So kind of the exceptions that I want to see in operations. And one of the things I liked about this, too, was um, all of these pretty graphics. It'll show you, like, how many jobs are in this selection of the pie, but I can drill down into these. 
And this is why I liked the visual pictures. Because I could see them, but if I wanted to get to the details of those 11 jobs, I could drill down in here and see further. And then I can drill down even further. You know, Maybe I'm responsible for troubleshooting these tasks, tasks that have failed. I can go on in here and retrieve the output. And you can have this automatically come back if you want to. It's just how much storage do you want in the database? Or do you just want to retrieve it on demand when something fails? So I can retrieve that on demand, pull that output back from the server so I don't have to log on to the server to see what failed. And then I can see that there, there's a problem with this task. And you'll hear me talk about tasks. That's kind of the unit of work that we talk about. Um, some companies still call them jobs. They might refer to them as jobs if it's some of the older job scheduling um, products that they're using out there. But this is just a, a particular instance of the task. So this isn't the live one that's down stored on the database. So I can go in here and make this change. And it's not going to permanently affect anything. But it's going to allow me to get this task to run successfully. So then I can update that. And I'm on the passive node. So somebody switched the nodes on me here. So maybe the live demo is not going to work. Well, maybe that part won't. We'll come back to the dashboard. But if I was on the active node, that would work and it would run successfully and I'd restart it. So I'll have to talk to my uh, C's out there and find out why I did, they switched the, the nodes. So this is one of the pages. Uh, let me scroll over here and we'll go to another one. And you can set as many of these up however you want to. I go into the scheduler one. Um, just we did a, a recent study on IT compliance and this was one of the things I really liked when I was managing the scheduling team for a number of years was I wanted to see what changes were being made and so many times I'd have somebody come out and say well you know what the automation did to us last night and after I got done laughing I'd say well yeah, the automation only does what it's told to do so having a very detailed audit trail one of the things that was always missing was what did they change you know, you could see some of the things that were changed, and I'll see if I can scroll down through and see some of these. Um, you'll see lots of different things. So anytime anything is changed in a definition and is saved to the database, OpsWise is going to go out there and create a new version automatically. And you can keep however many versions you want it to keep. That's a parameter that you can set. But it's always going to tell you exactly what it changed. Uh, I'm trying to see one of these that will show me since I'm on the passive. So what is changed is before and after the dashes. So it changed it from version 1 to version 2 or a change in properties. But I see, trying to find my example. These guys have been doing a bunch of stuff out here. Okay, here we go. So here's one I was just playing with here a little bit earlier. If you see the arrow sign in here, this is what it was before, and this is what it was afterwards. So I can see exactly what they changed because I've got versioning in here. I can easily back out to version 69 and not have any issues there. But what I really liked was the difference. A lot of products will show you, and if, it, if you look at the before and after, it's just a gobbledygook of characters. But extracting out that change, I can quickly get to what the person changed and make a, make a difference there. So that's why I usually go to the auditing one. And you could set as many of these dashboards up as you want. Um, I even created a mobile dashboard. I was working with some of our customers, and they're, and they're like, well, I don't want one that's got multiple columns in it. I want to be able to scroll down and see just the things that I want to see. And these are all fed by the reports that come with the product. So a lot of these reports, there's over 50, product, 50 reports that we ship with the product. And then you can create your own based on those or tweak some of the ones that we ship out there. And you've got that as well. So that's kind of the dashboards. And we'll come back to reporting. And I'll show you how you can create content. Because you can have these automatically distribu distributed to a URL. You can have it automatically emailed to management every morning if there's a report that they want to see. Um, you can have it automatically distributed and sent to them every morning. So I'll unhide this left-hand side. This is really where we get into the meat of the product. And everything happens in OpsWise based on triggers 
And triggers are more than just date and time. And we do have customers that have come from cron solutions and they're used to the cron. So like, can you give us a cron trigger? So we put a cron trigger in there. Um, but a lot of the customers rely on the time triggers and that can be a specific time. It can be an interval of time. What I really liked when job scheduling evolved to workload automation was the file triggers. And this is kind of where job scheduling some of the boundaries of some of the legacy products are still, they're still job schedulers. I don't care what they call them. They're still job schedulers. Because if I can't trigger something in dynamically when a change happens in a database or a file that I didn't expect to come in comes in and I can trigger that processing immediately, I'm just a job scheduler. But I'm a workload automation tool if I can dynamically trigger in workload whenever something happens. So we've got the file triggers out here. The task monitor triggers are really important because basically anything I can define down here is a task. So maybe the results of a SQL query are going to be what I need to trigger some workload processing and a workflow in. I could do that. Um, there's email tasks. So the task monitor trigger really enables anything I can define down here as a task to trigger something. Maybe it's when an application comes down. I've got application control tasks that I can use. So if I have a critical business application and if it comes down, I need to notify and escalate this immediately, I could do that using OpsWise. So some of the application monitor triggers are up here as well. And then the task types, I have lots of different types of things that I can do. And we'll go into one of these and I'll show you the forms are going to look very similar. So if I go into new form, and I would always tell new people that, that weren't used to defining this stuff, especially if it's in a different environment, all you have to tell me is what, when, and where. So, you know, give me a name, and this could be 100 characters for a name. You know, tell me where you want it to run. I can just pick an agent out here out of the list and pull down one of these agent names, and we'll just pick one of those and put it in here. I can use agent clustering. Um, and I can even, you know, as I install my agents on servers dynamically, I can make them automatically become part of a cluster. And I'll show you what the cluster broadcast is. That's something a little bit unique to OpsWise, too, and it can be real beneficial if you're uh, deploying a lot of different uh, servers out there in your environment rapidly. I can put these as variables out there, and then I can come down here and say, well, what do you want me to run? Is it a command? Is it a script? We've got a central script library that we also include as part of the product. So I can go down here and I'd say, well, pick one of these scripts. Now this was always the last excuse that some of the application developers had to have access to the production databases. So I got to get down there and I got to update that script. We just took that away. So that's off the table now. We can control the script library. They can update it here and OpsWise will deploy the script at runtime. So. Yeah, it is. This is a simple one that I've got in here. I can select a different one and, and you see the script content. So I can build the script in here. And you can see also there's a version 4. So anytime they make a change to that script, it's also part of the automatic versioning. So I can see that too. And then I'll scroll down here. There's other um, different things that you can add. Exit code processing. You know, if I want to put an exit code range in there, if the success output contains a certain string. I can, you know, look at the string of text and see if that's there. I can put my SLA information in here and say it's got to start by a certain time, finish by a certain time. Early finish was something I've run into um, in my data center days is I expected the job to run two hours and it ran in 20 seconds. So something was obviously wrong. If it finished successfully, nobody knew anything different because they weren't looking for that. So we put an early finish in here to catch those. And then automatic retries at different intervals. So, But basically you just have to know what, when, and where. And then once I've got that basic information in here, I can save that to the database, which is what the submit button is. It's not submitting it any, to any operating system. It's just saving it to the database. Does it become active instantly when you submit it? No, because it needs a trigger. Um, but this is a good one. Uh, there's safeguards built into this product everywhere. So if I filled this out and because I selected one of the options for the success output contains and didn't put a field in here, it won't let me save that to the database. So we'll just go back to the exit code range and just let it default. Uh, 
put a zero in here since I actually entered something there. So there's all kinds of safeguards built into it to keep you from saving something that has no chance of running successfully. Let's see if my touchpad's working right. Here we go. So now I save this. So I would actually have to manually trigger this in, and I can you know, go here and do a search and find it, and then launch it manually if I wanted to. Say I was on a development system. There we go. So I can go into it or I can right click where I'm at and just launch it manually. So I can just launch the task if I want to. Or I can set up a trigger. Now, I, I don't know what platforms you guys are running or the people that are on the broadcast, but I can go to Windows and it's going to look very similar. So the so the forms are going to look familiar. Um, there's just going to be slight differences, but depending on what type of workload. Um, but everything else is going to look very similar. So regardless of what type of workload you're responsible for, it's going to be easy because the forms are, are very easy to go in there and fill out the information that you need. Now, what most of our customers, and there is even some SQL tasks down here, so we've got customers that are using the SQL, and that can be for DB2, Oracle, um, MS SQL Server, whichever ones you're doing, and I'll pull up one of those. It's got a little bit different look and feel to it. But what's nice is we're going to build a workflow here next, and that's going to connect all of these disparate types of processes together into a logical flow of uh, work that you need to run together. And that's what we call the workflow tasks. And what I really liked about how they built this was a workflow is also a task type. So all of the power that I have for my individual tasks, I also have for the workflow level. And I'll go into one of my more complicated ones that I build and use for demos a lot, and that's my corporate accounting because it's got a lot of different, different types. And so I'm going to look at the workflow. And it's usually a little bit faster than this, so I don't know if it's... Uh, on my end or, or the connection or what. <laughs> but, okay, so this has got lots of different types of, of tasks in it. So I've got Windows, Unix, Linux, Mainframe. I've got some different icons up here. We even allow you to do a workflow within a workflow because some of our, our larger customers will have lots of jobs here and the, and the visual is just too hard to comprehend. So it's better for them to do a workflow within a workflow because I can drill down into this and see that there's a number of jobs under general ledger as well. So it goes down even deeper. And I can bring that up to the top and go back to my higher level view and get back to the big picture here. So one of the things that, that's um, one of the unique characters comparing OpsWise to some of the other competitive products is I can put everything that has to do with corporate accounting in one workflow definition. So whether it's end of month jobs, weekly jobs, third Tuesday of the month jobs, last day of the fiscal year, that one says, whatever their run frequency, they can be part of this. Because if it's not that particular run frequency, OpsWise is just going to connect the, the, pre the predecessor successors together. So it's going to preserve that dependency chain without me having to specify anything different. So it's got some smarts in it to allow it to do that. I can also put conditional connections in here. So if my accounting 2000 job fails, then I'm going to go down this remediation path and run some different jobs to get me back to where I need to be. So that's another sub-workflow that I can kick off automatically. And I can have start times associated with these, lots of different things that I run. And I'm actually going to go ahead and launch this and trigger this in so we can see it running live. And I'll go up to the activity, and that's where we can monitor everything. It's one of the tables that's in the database. And it's what's going to allow us to see everything live. And let's see, we'll just look at today's task instances. So if I find my workflow, I can even sort it here. So there's my workflows out here. I can go to my corporate accounting. And you'll get statuses out here, and they're color-coded. You can see kind of you know, by their coloring, are they running okay? Are they having problems? And here you'll see that the ones whose run frequency 
isn't applicable for today, they just get skipped. Now, some of our customers um, were at our Tech Ed conference, our, our user conference last year, and they said, well, that's all well and good, but I don't want to see all of that. Um, I'm not used to seeing all of that in the products I have, so can you hide those? So we even have an option where you can have your workflows come in with those automatically hidden. But what some customers ran into was, well, if I have a failure down here and I don't see that, maybe there's a job that should have run here and it didn't. Can I show those skipped ones? And we said, sure. So we gave them both options. So they can hide them, they can have them visible, whatever their preference is, they can see those. And then one of the other things we did with the automation was we made it dynamic. So a lot of the older products out there have schedule load concepts where once a day they're going to load everything up for the next 24 hours or the next 12 hours. We wanted to make this completely dynamic. So if you had to come in here and insert something while this was active, you could do it. So I'm just going to go in here and we're going to find some job and just drag it into the workspace and it's going to pop up and tell me, well, where do you want to insert it between? So I can pick a job or multiple jobs up here and then I can pick a job down here. And it's also got smarts enough to tell you that you can't create a loop. So I don't have to worry about that and it's just going to insert it in there for me. And that's an active passive node situation so it didn't didn't put it in there like it should have for me. Something I need to check with the SEs before I do a live demo. <laughs> so that's uh, one of the things that you can do out there. Um, let me show you a couple more workflows. One of the things I did, and I worked for a large retailer here in the Dallas area for 20 years, and one of the things we had was we had a common credit system, and we did I think it was this billing statement one. We did the same basic process for 14 different credit centers. And when I went to automation, I'm like, I don't want to have to define that 14 different times. I want to put a variable in there, and I want to define it once. So the product that I was using at the time allowed me to do that. And um, through the whole course of this and the intuitive dependencies, we were able to reduce the number of definitions we had by 60% and really drastically get that down. So I can have something like this that's got a variable in here which happens to be the dollar sign, the squirrely bracket RGN for the region I'm processing it for. And then I can have triggers set up if I look at all my triggers out there. And I use kind of the, the process or the technique that we use is we're, we're picking out a certain character set from the trigger name. So I'm just going to go to this fifth character and pull out these four characters and basically that's the one I'm going to determine my variable for. So if I trigger off the re east region here, we'll go ahead and trigger it, and we'll go ahead and trigger Amsterdam. Oops, I if I got that one. And then we'll go back to activity. So this allows me to just maintain one definition of billing, and I can pull these workflows up and you can see that it's resolving those based on a certain character set from the trigger name. So this is something that a lot of our customers have used to drastically reduce the number of definitions that their staff has to maintain out there. And even from a development side, and this is when, when I had the process analysis and improvement team, um, I had one of the guys from the store processing center come to me and, he, and he's like, if I would have known we had this kind of capability, I wouldn't have had to define 24 sets of each job that he had to run for the store processing. He would have defined one. So there was a 24 1 ratio, and there were hundreds of jobs in that store processing workflow. So all of the, the, the scripts and the JCL and whatever it took to run those could have been reduced 24 times for each one. So that was one of the great things that we have the capability to do. And there's a lot of built-in capabilities and built-in variables. One of the things you can get to from our website and hear from the product, if I hit the question mark, is you can get to our documentation. And it's all stored out there in a Confluence database. You can get to it without having to log on to the product, without having to, to contact Stone Branch. Um, we put it out there in the public domain, so anybody that wants to research Stone Branch and OpsWise can go out there and research it and see all the built-in variables that we have or whatever it is that they're looking for, if it's a web service API, anything like that. 
One of the other workflows I want to point out, I talked a little bit earlier about a cluster broadcast. And let me see if I can go down here and find our broadcast demo. So this was kind of a unique type of cluster that they put into the product. And if we look at this little workflow, it's just a simple three-job workflow. But what's different here, and, and I'm using a variable here, one of the built-in variables for ops agent name. But if I pull this up, we're going to find on this middle definition that he's not pointing to an agent or an agent cluster. He's pointing to an, a cluster broadcast. And what that means is when I go to run that middle job, any server out there that is part of this broadcast cluster, it's going to deploy this job to run on. So for some of our customers who have hundreds of servers and they're doing maintenance routines on all of these servers, when they deploy that server dynamically, they can automatically make it part of the cluster broadcast and it's going to run immediately for them. They don't have to do any maintenance updates to any job definitions, any task definitions out there. So we'll go ahead and launch this. And I'll go back to my activity. And you'll see a little different picture as it's running out here. So now I can see that it's deployed to different ones, and I've actually got a uh, symbolic variable there in my agent name. If I go ahead and release this one, and the command list that you come up with, I like this too, is they only give you the applicable commands based on the state the task is in. I don't get a whole long list of 30 or 40 commands that are possible. I only get the ones that are possible based on the state that it's in. So I'll go ahead and release that one. And it's going to go ahead and go. And now these got deployed to the three different servers and it resolved that variable name. So it's a really nice way to do maintenance out there and get that done. Now, from a DevOps perspective, I think one of the best things that we put into this product, and that's probably been a couple of years ago now, is this promotion and bundling. So I can go in here and I can be on this system and I can set up promotion targets. So I can have my dev environment, my QA, my test, my test to however many environments I had, I can have an OpsWise installed on. And I can set this up and I can set my targets up and I've got a demo two system out here. So if I come up here and I'm just going to copy this and we'll see if my demo two system, if I can get to it. Oops. And the joys of live demos. <laughs> it's working on it. Okay, so here's my secondary system. So maybe the first one was dev and this one's production. I would have to have log on capabilities to get into this system. And I actually had them change the color coding because we would get confused when we were doing some of the demos which system we were on. So we said, can you give me something different here so I'll know immediately when I lock on to this one that I'm on my in, uh, development system. So if I go down to workflows over here, I'm not going to find a DevOps one over here because we haven't defined it over here. So he doesn't see a DevOps over here. Now I can go over to the system and I can basically go into any of these and promote them one by one if I want to, but typically you might not want to do that. You might want to do a bundle and we'll do that next. So if I come up here and I look for my DevOps one, because that's what I want to move over into my production environment, Where did it go? Actually, let's do this. Hmm. Oh. Oh, I didn't create a workflow for that. Sorry. I created a task for that.
Okay, so if I want to promote this or anything anywhere in the pro product, I can just come down here and do promote. It's going to ask me where I want to promote it to, and I can pick my environment here. I've got to have user authority, proper user authority to promote it over there, so I can choose that and put my user ID in here, depending. I'm on here with admin authority, so it's not going to restrict me. Um, but I can go in there and make that to be authority specific, and now it's going to promote it over to that system. So if I go over to my system I just promoted it to, this is one of the things, if you're into IT, if you have any dealings with IT auditors, I can go into the promotion history, and I can tell exactly who, who did what and when they did it. So I go, and get, go out here and get the promotion items and see exactly what was promoted and when they promoted it. So I can see the different things over here. Now one of the other things we put in when we put workload lifecycle management in was we put bundling capability. So I can go to the tasks, to the triggers, to we've got virtual resources out here. There's a lot of virtual resource types that we support. Boundary, depletable, um, different resources, the script library. I could basically create a bundle, and we're just going to create a bundle by date here for the sake of time and complexity. So I'm just going to call this, we'll call this our DevOps demo bundle. And I'm going to go back to the beginning of the month and say anything that has changed since this date, I want you to pull it into this bundle. And it's going to create that bundle for me. So anything that I changed, if I changed calendar definitions, um, processing days, I've added new agents out there, um, anything that I've changed in here, it's going to pull into that bundle. So now if I look for that bundle, I can pull this up and get a bundle report that's going to show me everything that's part of that bundle. And these are some of the things the IT auditors are really grasping onto because some of the older tools, you could export and import definitions from one environment to another, but then you had to go get all of the other related definitions too. And even if I were to pull in a workflow to this and promote a workflow, it would pull in all the reference tasks, it would pull in resources, it would pull in everything. So basically, I could save this out to a file and whenever IT auditors came and knocked on the door and said, who did what, when did they do it, I have a list. And I have an automated list. So we're also automating how you can have these promotions happen so you can schedule the promotions to be done in a certain time. And you've got that capability as well. Now from a, a security standpoint, I wanted to point out some of the security features of it. If I go down here to users, And we're going to look at this accounting Jane Doe. So I can set the users up with different authority and I can give them roles and permissions and it can match what you've got set up in LDAP. It can actually pull it out of Active Directory into OpsWise. I can have user roles out there so this person only has access to the reporting. So they can publish reports, they can schedule reports, but they can't do anything else. And even within that access, I've only given them permission to see certain things or to read certain things. So it's got to start with accounting or start with fiscal flows. So you can do, and this is, you know, we, like, we talk to a lot of our customers about naming standards when we're helping them set up a system initially. Is you want to set up really good naming standards because then you can use that as you're granting access or, or doing different things out there in the product. I can put them in business services so I can have you know everybody that's in accounting can see my accounting stuff but they can't see any of the payroll or they can't see any of the finance or, or the store processing or whatever the business might be. Um, so I can set those up in different permissions so this person wouldn't have access to see anything outside of this realm um, into the reports and anything else that they set up. So speaking of that, back to reports, um, we'll kind of circle back and then I don't know if we have time for questions and answers. I left some time in there for that and we can go different places you want to go. So here's my saved reports, but if I scroll down through here, I think at last count, um, 
the global reports that we ship with the product, there were over 50 different types of reports. So we've got reports on agents. You can see in the dashboards what the status of the agents is that you have out there. You can see application status, audit records. The audit, the activity, and the history is where most people do their reporting from. So there's a lot of different types of activity, the reports that we've put out here. There's several different history reports that we've done as samples for people. Resources, we didn't get into a lot about resources, but there's a lot of virtual resource capabilities with this. Um, and even forecasting. And I haven't done too much on forecasting, but we're going to go here and we're going to create a new report so you can see how simple this is to do. And we'll stick with our DevOps. And I can make that report visible to certain groups if I've got different groups set up to everyone or just keep it to myself. Um, i got di di different types of charts that I can do. Pie charts, bar charts, and lists are the most frequently requested. There's horizontal bar charts, vertical bar charts, trend boxes. I played with some of these when I did some education at our Tech Ed Summit a few years ago. So we'll just create a bar chart. Uh, let's go. We'll go down. And you can see from the tables here, there's a lot of tables within the relational database that we expose, but like I said, most customers use only three or four of these maybe, um, but we do expose a lot of them because there might be something somebody wants to see in some of these tables. Mm -hmm. All the ones we expose, and if we don't expose them, if you're looking for information we don't expose, we can, we can get that to you um, or possibly expose that table if it's something that you need to see. So I'm going to go ahead and group this one by status because we're going to take a, whoops, hit the wrong one. We'll group it by status. And then I can put some other parameters out here so I can filter it by different things. So we're going to do start time <coughs> is in the last three months. And depending on which drop downs and which fields I select, you're going to have lots of different options in here, before and after, um, relative dates, absolute days. Uh, the reporting is almost unlimited when I start looking at playing with reports. So we'll go ahead and run this and see what we get. <clears throat> so I've got a lot of successful tasks out there and you can kind of play with this and do different things and see what kinds of information displays it in the way that you want to see it. And then go back up here and run the report again until you get to, to one of the ways that you like to see it. And uh, if I'm going to save this and I'm going to publish it on the dashboards, I'm going to typically come over here and make this a small chart and run it again so it takes up less real estate for me on the dashboards. Once I hit the Save button, I've got some different options that are going to be available. So now I can publish it. And publishing it means I'm going to put it to a URL. So I can put it on the intranet site and somebody doesn't have to call me anymore and ask me to send them this data, they can just go to the internet site, click on this URL, and it'll run the report dynamically for them. Or I can schedule the report, and I used to have a morning status meeting every day, and we had the same type of information they asked for, so I could have scheduled a turnover report and sent it to management every morning. And they would have it in their inbox at 6 a.m., 7 a.m., whatever, they could read it, you know, before work when they're having their coffee so I could schedule that report and have it automatically delivered or I can publish it as a gauge and that's what's going to allow me to add it to a dashboard so we'll go ahead and make a gauge out of this one and now it's been added to my dashboard <coughs> or it hasn't been added it's available for my dashboard I can go up here and now just I can add content. Let me go ahead and hide this left hand side. We'll add content and we're going to go into gauges. It was a history report. <coughs> so I'll just scroll down to history. Oops, I'll come down here and find my DevOps demo. They'll show me a preview of it and I can add it. And then I can move that wherever I want to move it. So if I want to move it over there, I can move it over there. 
So I think that kind of takes us full circle. It's hard to show everything <laughs> that this product's capable of, but I just wanted to give you a feel for where automation has come today and, and how easy it can be um, to use automation tools to manage your workload, whatever the size of your workload is. So are there questions? Have I confused you all? <laughs> I, I have a question. Okay. Uh, around security. Mm -hmm. So you're doing a job, and that job has passwords associated with it. And those passwords are mm -hmm. Is your product handle those? Yeah, we don't expose any passwords out in the open. So you can um, put those in a file somewhere. We could access the file, but as information was passed, none of the passwords would be exposed in any way, shape, or form. Um, it wouldn't do anything different with the encryption. I'm not sure. I haven't played around. PCI would require you to not store passwords in plain text in any place. Yeah. Uh, I know we've had, I've had problems with that in the past. Had to build custom encryption, decryption. Yeah, there's. In my experience, I've never run into an issue with that in here because none of the passwords are ever exposed in, in text in this product. It might access a file that's got the password in it, but we would never see it. It would just pass that file on to the job, but we would never have it. It would right, never right. be stored in the database or visible. Right, right, but you can't just leave it on disk unencrypted. It has to be PGP or whatever. Yeah. It, has, it, it, can all, it has to always be one of your examples had a password change. Some of us notice things like that. Have to comment. No. In one of the in one of the task definitions. One of the change things. Yeah. Oh, it did. You're showing the old. Uh, yeah. it was probably it was probably encrypted in there. It shouldn't it possibly have. Possibly was. It was. Yeah. It wasn't a, a usual easy to break. No. It it was. Some of the things that you probably saw in there, uh, I can go to the audits. Yeah. It was probably stored in a different way uh, using some, I don't know whether it was an algorithm or how it's encrypted in there, but it We're wouldn't expose them. PCI uh, certification process right now. So. Okay. <laughs> yeah, good luck. It's like, <laughs> oh yeah, there's one. <laughs> Yeah, I've never run into that issue, and I know some of our customers are in the finance industry and the retail industries, and it would never pass muster if it exposed any of that stuff. So, so you mentioned you had uh, cloud features here. So one of the challenges with cloud is that uh, servers just show up and then they go away, mm -hmm. right? And uh, so what kinds of features do you have to say? Um, you know, enumerate specific instances or possess any virtual functions or how do you, like for example, you get a customer on Amazon. Mm -hmm. right? So let's say they're creating, a, they, they spin up 50 servers to do um, you know, maybe an ETL load in the database at night. Right? They do some transform on that data. Uh, right. They want that job to run on those 50 servers as of course those have to be spun up. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, but there's some kind of waiting task there that we have to enumerate them to get the job, you know, to put the job out there and then wait until it's done. So how would I build a tax flow like that? Um, no, I don't know if I'm, I've got the detailed knowledge to answer it <laughs> exactly how you want it. Might be more of an SE question. Yeah, it might be, but one of the things that they did with the agents was they let them self-register. Okay. So our customers that are deploying dynamically um, in that manner, yeah. when they deploy the server, they have as part of the build an There's OpsWise agent. Or like yeah, that. an OpsWise agent gets on there with the proper naming standards, and as soon as that comes up, he registers with the controller and he's available for work. Okay. So if I've got a, a, a unit of work out there and, and I say run it on any of these servers in this cluster, those become part of the cluster automatically when it brings them up. And I think there's a similar process when you, you decommission those servers and take them out of the cluster. I, I have a question about your auto registry. 
Mm -hmm. Does that have a, a home address on it, or, or does it have some other technology? How does it auto register? When you put the agent definitions in there, he's got the home address of the controller. So he knows where the controller is and goes and finds them. How does the controller differentiate between many different agents showing up? How does he differentiate between How does he know he's a legitimate agent? How does the agent uh, identify himself as being legitimate to the controller? Is that your question? Yeah, um, similarly, you have five different nodes that you just spun up. How does, how does the controller tell which one's which? From that point forward, yeah. That? So, for example, like the way you know, Puppet would do that is you would register with the server, and then the server would have to sign a certificate before that client were considered legitimate. Another a number of tools I use, uh, you have to give it a, uh, a registration key. Or, you know, like Amazon, you have a, 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 your key and then your private key. You put that in there yeah. um, to validate yourself. I'll have to find out about that. I know we have customers that are using Puppet and different other tools to do that, and I'm not as familiar. I haven't done an install and, and been on that side of the business or that side of it, but I know um, I know people who do have the answers to that. <laughs> so. The question, does, uh, does the product uh, have an API as well? Do yes. Do developers create tasks through their own systems rather than going through this web UI? Yeah, and that's one of the things we recently added to the security too. I don't know if I've got any users down there. Um, typically, that's what we do when we go to the documentation is we look at the API. I'll see if it's on on Jane Doe. There is a full RESTful Web Services API, um, but the security we've added here is, is one of our customers said, well, I want to secure what Jane Doe has access to, so I'll let her access it through here, but she's not going to get through the command line and she's not going to be able to do it through the Web Services. So that was something new that we just updated for one of our customers. But yeah, there is. And you know, if you go to the documentation, it'll take you right to it and get to the Web Services API. But one of the POCs I've got starting this week, they're doing everything through Web Services. So. And there's also, um, you can get to this from stonebranch.com. I don't know if I can get to it here from the product. It's been giving me troubles lately, but if I go up here, and I go down to resources in the video classroom, we've got a lot of short two, three minute videos down here, and these are all publicly accessible, so you can go down here and see um, different videos on different parts of the product. You know, through forecasting, if you want more about that, if you want to see more about promotion and versioning, you'll hear my voice on a lot of these. <laughs> that was my former role doing some of these, the founders' voices on some of these. But you know, putting things like runbook notes in there, it's got a capabilities to do that. So there's a lot of things we just put out there in the public domain so people can get more information on the product and see what it's capable of. But it's gaining a lot of traction in the industry. Yeah. You know, who do your customers consider your competitors to be? How do they how do they compare you to them? Uh, our competitors range from any of the big you know, three IBM, CA, BMC, ASG, even in there, the legacy competitors, to some of the um, open source as one of our competitors because we get into some companies that are, uh, the companies I'm working with this week are doing open source, but they've just outgrown the open source tools, they don't have the support for them, whatever. Um, so those are competitors, Cron, we've got some smaller um, jams, I think is one of the products that's out there, so our competitors range from the small, even open source products up to the big CA7s and, and IBMs, TWS, and, and those, because we have a conversion services staff on board too. Um, we've got a number of, of products that we're converting from right now. We're doing a conversion from Control M, a conversion from CA's ESP, 
we've got, a, I think, a, a CA7 conversion going on, but, yeah. So. you mentioned Orbitz, I think? Orbitz is one of our customers. Do you have other customers? across the spectrum? Or we do. Larger? We have financial customers. Um, Royal Bank of Canada is one that runs over 10,000 of our agents. Um, there's some other financial customers here in the Dallas-Fort Worth area who are speaking at our conference. They're in a super secret location, so I don't know if I can mention their name or not. Neiman Marcus is one here in the Dallas-Fort Worth area that uses our agents. Um, ATOS is running some of our customers that are using um, our different products. But, uh, I was answer to the PCI stuff. Okay. Because uh, that's uh, eventually we're going to get probably to the point where we're going to have to do a lot more orchestration of the tasks and understanding how that. Uh, Just to put in perspective, we're trying to do all the same things you're doing where you use a manual tracking mode out of Zendesk. Out of what? Zendesk. Okay. Help desk tool. Okay. Development. So we know we're going to have to. Well, I'm not going to be as much concerned about that. A lot of that's going to be automated in other ways. But what concerns me is mainly the financial um, matches interacting with our customers. Mm -hmm. so that's going to come up. You know, I know we're going to end up with some, with some uh, match work and integrating back into their backend systems. And yeah. some understanding how I can secure um, the various credentials and and things that are being used to um, either you know, pull down the internet or submit data in those, uh, those batch efforts. Okay. I can get you guys this card, and I've got business cards here as well. Okay. Um, but you can pass those down. I've got, um, for the people on the broadcast, um, they can get a hold of me at julie.norris at stonebranch.com um, is an easy way, but I can set up custom demos for you guys. Um, our general manager is down here in Dallas uh, pretty frequently, um, and he's he's one of the founders of the product. He's one of the guys that, that wrote this thing from the scratch, so he always loves to have conversations. And we're talking to some of the retail companies in the area too that have the PCI issues that they have to deal with. But we have our technical user conference that's coming up here in May, and we're having it in Chicago um, for the second year. But we allow prospects to come to our user conference. Um, we had two there last year. Land's End is one we're doing a conversion from ESP from right now. And they were at our user conference as a prospect last year. And the energy, the culture of Stone Branch, they were used to having a product that was continually enhanced pretty rapidly until it got acquired. And on all the enhancements stopped for years. So they came over to OpsWise and they're in the middle of their conversion right now. <laughs> Close. <laughs> uh, but they were there last year and, and they they signed up and they're doing their conversion right now. So some of our conversion specialists will be there, but you know, I, anybody that's interested, you know, talk to me and, and you can come up in here and join us and talk to some of our other customers. Orbits will be there. But uh, all of our customers are in banking and retail, so yeah. uh, those problems will scale up. Yeah, one of our largest customers is AXA over in Europe, and they've got 20,000 of our agents deployed. So it varies. Like I said, there's a lot more agent customers over in Europe. There's a lot more OpsWise controller customers in the U.S. right now. But we just did ING Bank over in Belgium. We just did their conversion and are looking at ING Netherlands. So banking, retail. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. I found you guys just doing meeting meetup yeah. looks. So cool. Really cool. appreciate it. Well then, um, before we wrap up, I'd like to do some quick announcements. Um, first is the DevOps Days conference is coming up next month on the fifth and sixth. So it's a two day conference, and uh, and it looks like they only have fifty four tickets remaining uh, available. So. So if you want to go attend that, um, I know Alex and I will be there. Uh, tickets are two hundred dollars a piece, um, and uh, and yeah, it sales ends the day that the conference begins. So um, it's in Austin. So uh, so DevOps Days, if you don't know, is a um, is a kind of like a global tour kind of conference. They do it all over the world in different parts uh, of the year, um, and so. Uh, so 
April, May ish is when they normally come to uh, to Austin. So, uh, so yeah, go check that out. It's DevOpsDays.org. And then also we're we're going to be uh, preparing for our DevOps Live uh, annual conference as well pretty soon. And, and uh, that conference is uh, normally scheduled for October, so it'll likely be October again this year. So just uh, keep that in mind. And uh, and if you have any interest in getting involved or helping us secure speakers or any of the logistics, just come talk to me. And, uh, and we can let you know kind of what our needs are. Um, and, uh, and if you were there at the, uh, at the last one, yeah, you know how fun those things are. So I <laughs> so, uh, hope to see you all, see you all uh, next month, and uh, we'll talk to you again soon. All right. Thanks a lot, guys.